everybody, uh, and welcome to the Ramsey Library Brown Bag Series. And today we're very excited to have Susie Dettenberg here, who's going to be talking about something near and dear to librarians, the objecthood of books. Susie? Thank you so much, Jean. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Yes, thank you to the library and to Jean especially for organizing this lecture series and um, I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk about a subject that I really that I really love, how books can be incorporated into works of art. And is this looking good? Everyone can see the presentation here. Okay. Um, I'll I'll start with um, a painting that I've I visited for years. Um, every time I, I go to New York City and go to the Frick Museum, I always spend time studying this painting, this Vermeer painting. And um, it's a work that I began, that I started enjoying in grad school and um, loving, kind of being seduced by the way the fur is painted or these beads. Um, and then at some point in time, I noticed my reaction to this work shifting and really <clears throat> keying into this little um, blank slip of paper, ostensibly a letter that's being um, handed uh, to the woman on the right. And, and for all the, the kind of bells and whistles and complexity of this painting, this rather simple form really functions as a focal point, this sort of like sharp, um, simple shape. And while offering little content, but functioning as a form and a symbol. And that's, I, I think this um, shift in what I enjoyed about this painting coincides with a shift in my practice the past few years where I've been really interested in the subject matter of books in these um, like two flat planes of an open open book and that form in my own work and also just rather broadly interested in um, books as inspiration or object or material or subject matter in the works of other artists and there's a talk I give that deals more with text and imagery in books um, artists who are using um, incorporating those, those facets into their work, especially in paintings. But today I'm going to talk about blank books and artists who are really responding more to the form than the content of books. And I'll begin with, um, I'm going to begin with this, this work by Micah Bloom entitled Codex Project. So in this talk, I'm going to speak about um, works by other artists first, and then I'll um, conclude with conversation about my own contributions to this, um, this area of study. And I recently uh, came across this essay by this author, Anne Fadiman, entitled Never Do That to a Book. And she divides, she describes two different types of readers in this essay uh, that she terms carnal lovers of books and courtly lovers of books. And carnal lovers are these people that mark up their books and highlight and dog ear pages and rip covers and um, really affect the uh, changes on a book. And then there are courtly lovers of books who, who really revere books and aim to leave them untouched and use bookmarks and exercise special care. And so I'm starting with an artist who I believe to be a courtly lover of books, and then we'll follow with a number of more carnal um, lovers of books. So Micah Bloom is an artist who lives in North Dakota. And in 2011, there was a significant flood in his hometown that caused hundreds of books to be displaced and water damaged. And as the floodwaters receded, uh, Bloom like, riding by on his bike noticed all these books. And 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 took um, you know this really captivated his attention and kind of 
compelled him to do something in response to this. So he, he diligently collected them, um, researched the books, filmed and photographed hundreds of these damaged books. Here's another image of one. And then in 2015, let's see, this shows getting ahead a little bit. So this shows his, um, his archive where he's studying all these, all these damaged books that he recovered from this flood. And then this project kind of culminated in an exhibition in 2015 uh, entitled Codex at the North Dakota Museum of Art, where he covered um, the gallery floor with dirt, simulating uh, a cemetery, and then uh, performed this bur burial of these books um, that were wrapped in paper. And a quote of his about this project, um, Bloom says, when I was a child, my parents instilled in me a reverence for books. Books were not to be stepped on, sat upon, or abused because they contained something mysterious and powerful. Beyond their mere physical composition of wood, fibers, and ink, they played some indispensable role that demanded respect and preservation. In a magical way, they were carriers of that which was irreplaceable. They housed an intellect, a unique soul. And there is um, someone who wrote about this exhibition, the um, archaeologist William Kerr says, the tattered and torn carcasses of books in Micah's work could be an appropriate icon for the narrative of the book, moving from personal, practical, trusted, and beloved companion to artifact is in some ways the funeral of the book in its traditional form. And, and I think this is of course a topic that's really um, these sort of comments and feelings and emotions about books are um, ideas that are pretty, pretty relevant in our, um, in our society where books are playing, playing a new role and, um, our uses of technology are, are affecting them in various ways, perhaps making our relationships to books more special or um, enacting various changes. This is a work, uh, a document, a, a photo of a, a work by Marcel Duchamp that I would categorize as in the carnal category uh, entitled Unhappy Ready-Made from uh, 1919. So this is one of the older works I'll talk about today. Um, this artwork was a wedding present to Duchamp's newly married sister that really didn't consist of anything, any physical object, but simply instructions for his sister to go out and buy a geometry book and then dangle it by strings from, from their balcony. And he took special delight in the idea of this uh, of this book kind of changing its shape and form and being susceptible um, to wind, flapping the pages and creating a problematic scenario, like turning or tearing the pages, um, allowing rain to affect the book. And so this is a work that um, there's a playful degree of wanting to undermine the seriousness of this, specifically a geometry book. This is the artist John uh, Latham, a conceptual, a British conceptual artist who took issue with Clement Greenberg. He wasn't really a fan of Greenberg and disagreed with um, the American critics emphasis on the formal content of art and especially objected to his dismissal of British art as being too tasteful. So he decided to subject Greenberg to a test of taste both metaphorically and literally. And in August, 1966, Latham had assembled a group of students at his home where together they dismembered a library copy of Greenberg's, Greenberg's book. After removing the pages, they each tore the leaves into smaller fragments and then ate the American prose or rather chewed it over the paper being masticated, <clears throat> pulverized into saliva, with saliva into a pulp and spat out. The resulting mess was carefully collected and then using various chemicals and yeast left to ferment. 
When Latham received his overdue notice from the library at St. Martin, Martin's School of Art, he responded by returning a vial containing the distilled essence of Greenberg. For this gesture, Latham was dismissed from his teaching post at St. Martin's, but in this instance, he had the last word. He went on to transform his record of the action, comprising letters, the overdue notice, and the vial itself into a work entitled Still and Chew, Art and Culture. And that's this work here. Um, in the collection at uh, MoMA. An, an artist with, I think, a, a bit of a more serious tenor whose work I have really enjoyed um, discovering and studying over the past few years is Rachel White Reed, a very well-known sculptor who wasn't as known as a painter, wasn't as known to me until semi-recently, but um, a significant accomplishment. Rachel White Reed was the first woman to win the Turner Prize. And this work is a Holocaust memorial in Vienna. It's an inverted library, the entrance to which um, are these two doors without handles. And go to another. So these images show a little more of the kind of surrounding area where this is installed. And then a detail of the facade comprised of these books with their, um, with the spines pointing in toward the structure. And it's a memorial to what, what is irredeemably lost. It's comprised of these blank, um, books and pages, numerous uh, tomes and pages that can't really be read or, or accessed. You can't get into the interior of the library and take a peek at the identities of these books. Uh, this is also the location where this work was installed is a medieval synagogue or the location where a medieval synagogue was burned. So in uh, there are a few different layers to the, the meaning of this piece um, in terms of discussing and talking about loss. And here's a, another shot, a detail of the, the exterior of that uh, location, of that piece. And then this, this work, Untitled or Paperbacks, is I guess I should um, give a little bit of context. So Rachel White Reed's practice is involved with casting. All her works are um, cast in some way, different using different materials. Um, this work in particular is really about lost positives. Where so so what you're looking at here are plaster casts of the negative spaces around books on library shelves. And so you have these, these kind of like heavy portions of plaster that would be like the, the empty space, the air above books till you, before you reach the next shelf. And so her work is really a record of these, of these negative spaces. Here's another image where you can just see a fragment of this project and um, imagining how the books originally were underneath these, um, the tops of each sculpture fragment with the, um, the spines out, the pages turning in. And some of the color you see in this work are, are just by virtue of the books um, kind of dyeing the plaster or some of the fragments or fibers of the books being stuck in the plaster as they're, as they're pulled out or extracted um, in the casting process. And a couple other images of this piece. There's kind of a starkness to her work that I uh, respond to. And there's something about Rachel White Reed's work who I also kind of consider to be in that carnal um, category that there's um, certainly some degree of destruction that's taking place um, to or some damage that's taking place to books and making this work of art. And I, 
I think that's one reason why I'm pretty interested in this piece because it really gives voice to that and makes that very visible and just brings up this topic of production and destruction that I think uh, pervades so much of our life in, in many different ways. Like anything, so many things that are made require resources and incur waste and, um, and sometimes we are, are complicit with that and not really thinking about it that much or too troubled, but this is a work that sometimes can bring up a sense of like a, a discomfort with the idea of these like books being covered in plaster and then pulled out of the plaster. Uh, the next artist I have been really interested to get to know a little bit over the last couple of years is Buzz Spector. And in his words, he's an artist who stacks and tears books. This is an installation, uh, an exhibition at Indiana University with these different piles of books stacked in really particular ways. And this is a work of his where he's tearing pages of a book in a kind of particular way to create this, this cascade of these um, pages moving from thick, a, a thick um, layering of pages by the spine to a a really thin um, ordering of pages close to the edge of the book. He calls this giving the books a buzz cut pun. And here's a detail of that piece. So a little bit about his process. He, um, this, this way of working came about through a drawing process where he, found himself really loving the physical nature of a torn, the torn edge of a piece of paper, which I think um, kind of is something that printmakers often really respond to that organic sort of beautiful um, nature of the torn edge of a piece of paper. So he would, but something that he noticed was that this torn edge had a special, um, a special soft, quality that was different from the rest of the surface of the paper. And he began to use that as a, to make drawings, um, shading that portion of just that like torn portion of the piece of paper, and then um, stacking these pages to create drawings. And then eventually uh, decided to do without the, the graphite part of the process and just use the torn pages uh, to create these works. Here's another example in this instance, including uh, black gesso that was applied to the book and then the pages are torn. And this piece altered Lewitt is um, where he actually took two different uh, Saul Lewitt books and cut the spine down the middle into two different pieces and um, inverted one half and then glued them back together. And here's a, a close up or a detail of that piece. And so he's exerting this creativity in, in reforming our view of um, this record of an artist's work. Here's another image from a different point of view of Buzz Spector's piece. The next artist is Stella Waitskin, who I discovered her work through the Asheville Art Museum that owns a piece, or there's a piece in their collection. And um, I began, she began her career as an abstract expressionist painter. So painting was very important to uh, Waitskin throughout her life. She studied with Hans Hoffman and Willem de Kooning, but eventually at some point in her career started transitioning to sculpture and um, melting glass and, and then finding this medium that really became her primary medium, which is polyester resin. And Waitskin is a lover, was a lover of books. She collected thousands of volumes and books eventually in her life became her, her primary focus, the primary subject matter. So she would cast these old leather bound books in resin and incorporate them into 
an installation in her apartment in Chelsea Hotel. So here's a, a view of this of this installation where there are other cast objects and sometimes just um, actual objects, actual books, but most of these forms are cast in, in resin. And so she really was creating this, um, this collection, this archive, this library of her own making and her own, her own influence. And I, I gave a lecture this summer at the Mount Gretna School of Art in Pennsylvania. And, um, after the lecture, met a, an artist that was there at the same time, who is friends with Waitskin's son. And he explained a little bit more of the history of this process that her, um, her father and her husband both worked for this lighting manufacturing company in Manhattan, and so had access to um, these lights that like the heat from these lights were used to cure the resin. That was his um, understanding from talking about the process with her son, but I'll show a couple more images of these works. So Stella Waitzkin viewed books as metaphors for intellectual freedom and, um, but also viewed language as pliable and not beholden to one reality. Um, there, there were kind of, two different um, perspectives that she's taking in these works, like a, a great love for the content of books and also um, some pulling back or uh, questioning texts that can sometimes be misleading. And so she crafted books that were really um, concerned with form and would distort the the form of the book or, um, and definitely make the text unreadable. But I like these pieces for their color and kind of the, the strangeness of this, this whole body of work, which was collected by the Kohler Foundation and has been, um, so her installation can now be viewed uh, at the Kohler Foundation. Another um, artist who is also, or primarily a writer, the celebrated poet and essayist, essayist Mary Rufel, makes these works of art where she erases content in various ways using markers, correction fluid, paint, tape, uh, sometimes cutting portions of text out of a page. Uh, so these various ways of, of erasing words erasing the language on the page. And, and then sometimes also adding other things, collaging other, other things into these books, um, other texts or photos, drawings, uh, grocery lists, fingerprint samples, pressed flowers, tangles of string. So this is a piece um, from a book, The Story of Ida published in 1883 and she's glued half a signed check for one cent on one um, side of the the spread and then the text on the facing page reads a poet that first happy winter I was beginning to earn money so Rufel made has made 110 of these books this is kind of um a daily practice that she talks about, she identifies as a hobby, but then gives this qualifier that she really believes all art making is a hobby. If you take the original or strict definition of a hobby being something that a pursuit that elicits intense personal pleasure. And she's really drawn to books that she describes as being boring, obscure texts that nobody reads, nobody wants to read, uh, especially liking works that are kind of overly sentimental. And uh, I'll just read a quote. Um, she says, the two pages are a field. The words are growing in the field and they hover over the page. They're like flowers and I pick the ones I like. My eye is roaming all over trying to make connections. Which I thought was interesting. And then the, the next and last artist I'm gonna talk about 
today is, before I talk about my work, is Ed Ruscha. And Ed Ruscha is, is known for an artist who's very well known for his work with language um, in publishing many, many artist books, creating paintings of uh, these scrolling ribbon-like words or text. But I've been really interested in this uh, bit more obscure um, body of work by Ruscha that it was shown at Gagosian Gallery in 2012, but the series of paintings of books that are um, quite large, I'll show an installation shot here in a moment. So these first few images are paintings of books found at thrift stores. This is old book back then, old book today, some mold, conservator's nightmare, and old book with wormholes. And then there are also these um, kind of opposite paintings that focus on fancy books. I love this title, Gilded, Marbled, and uh, Foibled, uh, belying I, I, what I understand to be Ruscha's kind of impatience in a way with um, very fine artist books that were rarefied and expensive and hard for the public to be able to access or appreciate. And he was more interested in his work in producing books that were more easily accessible by the public. And then this piece, uh, another painting fan book. And, and then history book laying on a table. And in terms of scale, they're quite large as this installation shot. Um, shows and he describes these work as a bit these works as a bit ominous um a memento mori to the book in a way and so i'll transition to after um looking at some of these heavy hitters throughout history who have uh, made such significant works dealing with books look at a few of my humble contributions to this um <laughs> this motif. So this is a, a painting, Academic Abutment is the title that I made. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't put dates on here, but I'm happy to clarify the, the time frame of these works. I think this piece was made in 2014. And surrounding this idea of questioning like how much a book needs help to be to be animated or exciting or propped up to become more interesting so um like propping up this page to try to create this sense of this book being animated this is a, a drawing using silver point on board um, that is a documentation of a, a kind of process i engaged with for about uh, a year where there was one edition of Art Forum magazine that I started to paint uh, first on the beach in the summer summers at this time I would travel to Maine um, spending time with friends there so I took this Art Forum magazine to Maine um, I was living in Indiana at the time but um, spending summers painting in Maine so I would um suspend this magazine from these two posts and paint paint it kind of open and suspended with this backdrop of the ocean and and then when I in the fall when I came back home to Indiana I kept working with this this exact same single um, publications magazine as a resource to make a number of paintings and so in the process this this object just became really kind of wrecked, um, salt and sand and um, ocean spray. And it, it really was pretty abused by the end of, of a year of making artworks with this single object and travel, you know, traveling um, to different residences with it. And at some point I dropped it in um, the bathtub. And so that really made it change its format and became all kind of wrinkled and really complex. So I, I just became interested in that complexity, like this very, very weathered object and all this, um, all these 
uh, tiny planes and all this information that accrued over this time period of using this object. So this is a drawing recording the, the complexity of all its wrinkles and folds. But it also um, was a, a process and a project where I was questioning um, how one wants to spend their time researching or reading um, the virtue of like a deeper engagement with a single source versus um, a broad, perhaps more shallow engagement with a number of resources. And so the, the Happenstance um, magazine in the bathtub led to some, some observations about paper when it's become wet and then dried. And when, when paper is immersed in water, it's incredibly free. And I, I made some video works um, documenting this, these pages of books floating in water and moving through water. And they're um, really quite captivating <laughs> in their beautiful undulating shapes as these um, pages are kind of loosened in a body of water. And then when extracted from the water and allowed to dry, the pages would become um, extremely rigid, brittle, kind of starched and often fused together, like hard to pull apart, making the resource pretty, pretty unusable, difficult to read. Um, so this is a painting kind of showing that state of these four pages from the same magazine that was dried after becoming wet. And they, while bearing different imagery, they have the same kind of wrinkle patterns. And another painting investigating some similar ideas. And I'll read uh, a quote by an artist, Richard Baker, that I, I feel um, relates to this work. Books have always been important to me. As physical objects, they are powerful fetishes, icons, containers of every conceivable thought and or emotion. They come to stand for various episodes of our lives for certain idealisms, follies of belief, moments of love. Along the way, they accumulate our marks, our stains, our innocent abuses. They come to wear our experience of them on their covers and bindings like wrinkles on our own skin. And it, so often I feel in my work, I'm, um, I have the, the pleasure of like working on something and working on an idea and then finding um, in process a quote or an artist's work or an article or something that so aptly expresses what I have already been um, sort of thinking and, and focusing on. And it was, it was nice to find this, um, this piece of writing by Richard Baker, who also paints books, is, um, shows it to Bordenage Gallery, and his expression, his um, parallel drawn of these like wrinkled books, like wrinkled skin, or these things that kind of like age um, together. So after making a number of paintings of, of books and magazines in sort of the, uh, a hyperbole of their wrinkles, like extreme use, I, um, I decided I, I wanted to give more direct expression to these concretized forms uh, and create objects that that felt like they really spoke to the rigidity that I was interested in experiencing and have this paper that's often seen as so um, malleable could become so, so rigid and impliable. So I started um, attempt, you know, working to make sculptures. It was a new realm for me and um, it's been, there's been a, a lot to learn in the process of um, learning about casting processes. So this is a, a cast work, um, creating a plaster mold by pouring plaster over a book, extracting the book after the plaster dries, and then um, pouring liquid clay slip into the plaster mold to create this, this clay piece. And after creating a number of ceramic cast 
book works. Um, I began making wax casts of book forms. And there's something about the cast. One thing I like about the casting process um, in, in certain ways and certain applications, the materials are really lightweight. So it seems they seem um, to really speak to the lightweight nature of paper or books. And I also like about casting that uh, depending on the material, casting materials, plaster, silicone can be very, very sensitive, kind of like picking up on every, every little um, dent or wrinkle or undulation. And, and I liked that, that record of all these, all these details of these books and um, records of these incidences of use. And this is a sculpture of a book that is kind of turning a 90 degree angle, um, falling off the edge of a, of a surface or a table. And the next few works are a series of pieces I made for an exhibition at White Space Gallery in Atlanta, where I wanted to pair these book forms with um, furniture to talk more about books as an experience in daily life and sometimes as a, um, wistful or hopeful part of life, but then in reality can become neglected. So this is, um, these are books that have kind of sunken in and become fused with this coffee table form. Um, a book on a nightstand that's starting to like, it's been there so long, it's like taking on the, the shape of the nightstand. This piece is a book um, falling off a lectern, but hanging on. And back to the, one of the original experiences, a, a book um, trying to give expression to this book submerged in this bathtub. And, and then the last few paintings I'll show are um, a series of paintings where I'm um, again, so sometimes make, so these, this is a painting using some of these cast sculptures as subject matter for the still life painting. This is a painting of the mold, a mold that I was using to make the sculptures. So um, going back to the sculptures and using them as, as reference for paintings. And I was especially interested um, at this point in, in symmetry or near symmetry of these, of these book forms and the way that symmetry can kind of create a, a sense of formality in a work and make something um, seem elevated. And I wanted to, to use that format to express um, something of my enjoyment and reverence for books. And Another one more quote that I'd like to read by a book by Peter from a book by Peter Mendelssohn entitled What We See When We Read it says, when I read, I withdraw from the phenomenal world. I turn my attention inward. Paradoxically, I turn outward toward the book I'm holding. And as if the book were a mirror, I can feel as though I'm looking inward. The idea of a mirror is an analogy for the act of reading, and I can imagine other analogies as well. For instance, I can imagine reading is like withdrawing to a cloister behind my eyes, an open court hemmed by a covered path, a fountain, a tree, a place of contemplation. Reading is like this closed eye world, and reading takes place behind lids of a sort. An open book acts as a blind. Its boards and pages shut out the world's clamorous stimuli and encourage the imagination. And I, I, what, I, what I like about that in um, some of these pieces is the, in my structuring of these paintings, like wanting the book to fill the space and kind of wanting to give um, voice or expression to um, this experience of just being lost in a book and absorbed and so many other things, other distractions fall away. And last, I'll um, conclude with a series of paintings 
based on this painting that I showed before, um, where this, the, the simplest version of book form, which is just a folded piece of paper, um, I'm painting this piece of paper as the sun is setting. And then also my eye level is, is dropping down. So with each painting, um, the shadows are deepening, things are getting a little bit darker and my eye level is shifting. And I made this series in response to the passing of a very close friend of mine who passed away this past January and someone who was very instrumental in instilling in me this deep love of reading and literature. And I'll maybe exit um, my screen share and um, take any questions. Thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Hey, Susie, I, I have a question yes. for you. Hey, that was an excellent talk, by the way. Thank you. Thanks. So it's probably because I'm a sculptor myself, um, but I respond, I think, the most to your sculptures, uh, more than your paintings. Um, and also, it's interesting to me that a lot of the influences you went through were sculptors, um, more so than painters. Um, so I guess my question is, do you foresee yourself in the future creating more three-dimensional work? And if so, what, what were you thinking? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I did show, I did happen to show a lot of sculptures today. Um, and I, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I um, really, really love painting <laughs> and um, can't, uh, you know, I, I'm certain painting will continue to have a, a huge um, part in my practice, but I've, I've been thinking, um, I haven't really Done, made any like practical headway with this, but I, I really love casting, but I, um, sometimes I have mixed feelings about wax and, um, some of the materials I'm using. So I'm kind of interested in, yes, seeing how perhaps painting and sculpture can come together. I, um, I'm not as interested in like painting on ceramic sculptures, but I've been, um, wanting to try casting paper pulp and thinking about like watercolor painting on um, paper cast objects. So that's something that might occur in the future. Another thing, a new medium to figure out sort of, but. Thank you. And I'm seeing a question from Christy in the chat um, to follow up on Jackson's question. What about the casting process attracted you? Do you think you might move into a more free form sculpture? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, thanks for that question. That's a great question. I, in my, in my paintings, I really enjoy in painting a degree of abstraction. I, um, or expressive mark making. I, I think I've um, been very influenced by painters I've studied with who really enjoy um, abstract expressions painting and themselves are influenced by those movements. So there's something in my painting process that I really value in the paintings being um, expressive to some degree. And so I don't, I, I wasn't really interested in my paintings being um, so, um, kind of hyper realistic to really give, to really embody the qualities, uh, the rigidity, um, kind of the qualities I was experiencing in these books and magazines that I wanted to express. And I just didn't feel like painting was um, the best, the best medium and wanted to just like start the separate project. And, and went to casting because it felt like something um, attainable to me as a way to record um, these sort of ephemeral conditions of, 
of books that are slightly wrinkled and just wanting to actually just express something that I, this tension that I find in myself when I'm reading a book, I'm, I can often go back and forth between like being really absorbed in the content of what I'm reading. And then all of a sudden, like note, just being very aware of um, a quality of light on a page that's allowing me to see a little like depression or wrinkle or slight tear or something. So um, just the way I, I noticed those things, I, I felt like s- these cast pieces might um, be more beneficial in, uh, or like a closer connection expressing that. Um, freeform sculpture, possibly. I um, am working on some pieces for an exhibition or um, conceptualizing some pieces for <laughs> an exhibition that will take place in, in Berlin and in Germany in March. and. Um, that's, that's very much a question on my mind, how more of, um, the, the hand or, um, it's like mark making that I love in my paintings could come into place with the sculptures. It's a really good question. Um, the need to paint the sculptures. I, Tammy, can you, can you clear? I generally don't paint the sculptures, but could you, I have used um, like different colored colors of wax. Is that what you're? No, sorry. Um, You were discussing that you you didn't want to paint from the actual magazines or books and then instead made the sculpture casts from them, but then you painted the casts. Oh, so what was, um, what was the cast not giving you or what did the painting give you that the cast didn't? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have been, I, I do, my paintings are made both from the original objects and from the the sculptures and the the casts so I am um yeah thanks for that for that question I I like thinking about this um so I I am making paintings from both sources and I think they they provide they provide different things sometimes when I'm when I'm painting from a, a book or a magazine directly I don't always love the the um the tension of the the content along with the form and sometimes I want to be like I really want to just pay attention to these um small like wrinkles and depressions and the features of wear on the book so what the cast pieces accomplish it's like I I don't see the text I don't see the images I'm really able to just um observe the um, the form that the the cast work presents and why make paintings I, I guess I, I like the circularity I get these two different versions of an experience um, I feel the sculptures are one particular like feel, they feel a little more like documentary to me like one particular record of um, these objects that I'm I'm really interested in and then I I hope the paintings are more expressive. I want the paintings to be more um, bear a motive content or more my like um, my feelings and my reactions to to these forms. So that's um, my goal. But thanks everyone for for being here, and thank you again to Jean for organizing. Hope you all have a good day. Take care. Mm-hmm.